Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Good morning, everybody. Uh, it's my pleasure this morning to introduce a uh, good friend to the HIP Research Group here at Microsoft Research, Susan Sim from the University of California at Irvine. Um, like us, she's very interested in the uh, sort of human aspects of the software development process. And uh, she tells me that she has a very sort of non-traditional format talk for us this morning. So I'm, uh, I'm very intrigued and anxious to see it. So welcome, Susan. Thanks, Rob, for the introduction. Um, so I'm going to be talking about some work that I've been doing, more thinking uh, than work. Um, it's heavily influenced by science and technology studies. Um, as I looked back on the research that I've been doing for the last 10 years, um, I was look I've been looking at you know psychological factors in software development. I've been looking at social factors in software development. And anytime I look at social factors, there's the psychology or the organization. And when I looked at the psychology or you know socio the social factors or the psycho, there's always something missing from the picture. And um, as I brought more and more stuff in, it was got more and more complicated. And this is, um, I also got into science and technology studies because it seemed to provide a way of dealing with more stuff or more factors. Also, um, for my PhD thesis, I uh, worked on benchmarking, which is an evaluation method for software tools. Um, but also, in, in order to interpret my results, I used um, Thomas Kuhn's theory of uh, scientific revolutions um, about scientific paradigms and things like that. So I already got my toes wet into um, science and technology studies. Um, so science and technology studies, what it tends to do is look at, let's see, let's see if you can wake this up. The computer's gone to sleep. So um, science and technology studies is kind of like, you know, you take the, your, your psychology, you take your sociology, or your social factors, and you place it within the context of a culture. And you also place that culture in the context of history. Um, and it's the idea that people are essentially the same over time. The trappings might change, the clothes that we wear might change, the devices that we use, um, and all of the technology might change, but we're essentially the same. Um, and so it has that basic idea. Um, and it's really good at asking broad, sweeping questions about what is the nature of things, what are the interactions. It's not so good at uh, answering questions. Um, so uh, I've been thinking about the question of what does it mean to program a computer? Um, because this is at the heart of um, a lot, this is kind of the, qu the kind of question that STS asks. But also, I think this is the kind of question, uh, the kind of what if question or the fundamental question that you can ask to, that will lead you down alternative paths or lead you down other pathways. Um, in building software, you, all, you, you try and identify what the requirements are in the beginning. But when you're working with a customer, um, you, they oft, customers often have a difficulty expressing what their requirements are. Um, because they're too entrenched in their own environment to see outside. Also, they don't know what the capabilities of the technology are. So you need somebody who is a technologist or a requirements engineer, software developer, or somebody like that to go in and you do a little bit of psychotherapy and say, what is it that you really want to achieve here? Um, they call this you know, um, paving the cow path. Sometimes customers just ask you to automate what it is that they've already done instead of build me a better way. Um, and so by asking this kind of question, then we can figure out whether we are paving the cow path when it comes to software tools, or uh, is there another way? Is there another way to do what it is that we want to do? So the question I'm starting out with is, what does it mean to program a computer? And we all have an intuitive sense of what this is, because, you know, you can, if I told you, you know, is this person technical or is that person technical or not? You have a pretty, you can tell me pretty quickly um, whether someone is a real programmer or not. So a systems programmer is a real programmer. 
a, um, a visual basic programmer are not real programmers. Or say, um, a, a GUI programmer may not be a real programmer. So we have these intuitive ideas about what is real programming or what is not programming. So what does it mean to program a computer? So um, the title of this talk deliberately riffs on um, Donald Knuth, The Art of Computer Programming. And this is a pretty hardcore idea of what it means to program a computer. So you know, this is the second edition, has three volumes in it of a planned seven, eight volumes. He's working on the fourth volume right now, and he has to keep releasing subsections of it because it's getting to be too big. And there, he's talking about you know, turning that into two actual volumes. He may not finish this before he dies. But in general, computer scientists revere this work. They think this is a huge achievement. It's, it's um, a, a pinnacle in terms of intellectual work. Firstly, it's got analysis of algorithms, running time, efficiency, and he's trying to comprehensively cover all of the algorithms that we know. And um, it's not even written in a high-level language. It's the, co the code examples that he gives you are in uh, machine language, so that you will have a basis for comparing the, um, the comp complexity and time costs of each of these algorithms. So. Um, so this is a particular view of what programming is. It's very mathematical, very algebraic, um, that this is, this is what it is. That, and that you know, the pinnacle or the, the kind of achievement this represents is, is, is like, more like math than it is like human factors. Um, it's, you, it's somebody sitting in front of a computer entering the codes, instructing the computer, telling the computer what to do. These are the steps. Execute this. And, and if you do it right, we're, we're going to be OK. Um, I should mention that this is work in progress. Um, this is the first time I've given this talk. And um, I, I, I don't really know how to publish this work. Um, so if you have any comments for me, feel free to stop and ask, ask me questions or, or you know, talk to me afterwards and say, oh, this is what you can do with it. OK, so what is the image of the programmer that comes out when you hold this up? As a, as a model or a paragon for programming? Well, it looks like this. OK? It's a stick figure, genderless. No clothes. I mean, not that he's naked or she. It's that the clothes don't matter. You know, they're, they're, the gender doesn't matter. The, the, all of the social trappings don't matter. There's the chair, and there's the computer, and the person sitting in front of it. That's it. What's the most important thing? The noggin that is driving the fingers to type things into the computer. Um, this uh, comic is taken from a website called XKCD. Does anyone w read this? Yes. OK, so um, uber geek, very, very geeky. But I just laugh so much. I guess it just shows how much of a geek I am. Um, most of the drawings are stick figures. And you know the joke here. Um, if I had to explain to a space alien or you know, uh, an English major why this is funny, right? That it's a person sitting in front of the computer. But also, this, this both contrasts against um, Knuth's idea of programming and also what is actually done when you develop software. Where in Knuth does it talk about, you know, my code is crashing when given pre-1970 dates? Knuth does algorithms. This is software engineering. This is programming in the real world. This is you know, pre-1970 dates is significant because you know, the beginning of the epoch was, it was in 1970. And so Unix times are given starting 1970. But where does Knuth talk about this? And also, this interaction here, the person telling the joke to the guy, this is funny because we have this culture. We have this funny culture because you know, we like to take things literally, but we also kind of step outside ourselves in terms of taking things literally. We're very mathematical, very analytical, but we're analytical about being analytical. And so we make a lot of jokes like this, that it's both a pun and it's also you know, uses domain knowledge. Someone who doesn't know, you know about the epoch, and, and also the, it, it's a play on words. It's a pun that you know, epic versus epoch. 
Um, and so it's not only, th this looks like just somebody typing on a computer, but it's not. There's so much more there. And it's only when you start having to take these things apart. And this is what science and technology studies is really good at, um, at, at providing you these lenses for taking these things apart. Um, because when you t look at the sweep of history, when you look at the sweep of different cultures, for example, epic and epoch are only close with an American accent. If you do this with a British accent or an Australian accent, it's not as funny. So, um, so this is where you start to see the culture and, and also the, the sweep of history. All right, so I'm going to show you. Does anyone recognize this? It's the difference engine. This is um, built, I think, about five years ago. Um, Charles Babbage's difference engine, often hailed as, um, you know, the first computer. I mean, when you get into it, there's lots of debate over what constitutes the first computer. But say, a lot of people say this is the first computer. And um, I'm going to play you a little video. It's, I apologize for the quality of the video. But um, I was reading about the difference engine. I'd even read uh, William Gibson's book on the difference engine. And I said, oh, well, big whoop. You know, it didn't work. He wasn't able to build it. It was so big, this, that, and the other thing. And it wasn't until I applied an STS lens and also that I saw this video that, you know, these light bulbs went on and said, ah, what are we doing? Okay, so let me try and find this video. Um, let's see, over here. Every turn of the engine's driving handle is carried through gears, cams, rods, levers, and springs to release and arrest precisely aligned number wheels. The helical arrangement of steel fingers continually pulls the register towers to find and perform the carrying of tens in its continuing sweep upward. It is mesmerizing. The intricate printing section can be programmed for one, two, or three column output, for two font sizes at once, for variable margins and column gaps, even word wrap where necessary. In the spring of 2008, a clone of DE2 commissioned by Nathan Mirvold was completed at the Science Museum and shipped to California. At the Computer History Museum, it would charm new thousands of discerning eyes. Today, the crotchety proud genius, who never managed to prove it during his lifetime, has a fair claim to honor as a pioneer in the history of intelligent machines, just as his parlor guests in 1832 suggested. His difference engine continues to inspire the admiration of his intellectual heirs, a celebrated and unique icon to chroniclers of computing. Charles Babbage, remember, never saw it except in his stubborn, prescient dreams. So that's the difference engine. It was built to um, create uh, calculation tables. Um, I think the closest thing that we have these days is maybe looking up F values when you do statistics um, that, you know, if you've ever done statistics as an undergraduate that you, you know, calculate your F value and then you look up in a table whether it's statistically significant or not. That's the only place that I've ever seen these kinds of calculation tables used. Also, maybe in the ba back of your trigonometry textbook, you might have a table of sine and cos values. But back in these days, everybody used these values uh, because, you know, you didn't have calculators. You didn't have a device that you carried around to calculate these things for you. And if you wanted to know them in any practical, usable way, you had, would have to look it up on a table. And so the production of these tables was a tedious, time-consuming, important problem. And this is the exact problem that, uh, that Babbage was working on. Okay, where's the software? 
You see the hardware, but where's the software? Ah, okay, so one, possi one possible answer is that there is no software because the idea of software hadn't been invented yet. But what does it mean to program this, right? So the thing with this is, this is a software as we know it didn't exist here. But this device was programmed, and it was programmed using hardware. And it didn't calculate, it, it's not a, this is one of the things that set this apart from um, devices that came before it. Um, is that it would calculate an arbitrary equation, I mean, within certain constraints. It could only do certain powers and it could have only have a certain number of terms. And the, um, the final answer could have at most 32 digits. But the equation that it calculated could be entered into it somehow. You would, and basically, you go around back and you flip a bunch of switches. And so that's how you programmed the software or you, that you program, the so, I mean, program this device. I mean, compared to, uh, uh, they would have logarithmic computational devices that you would have a little uh, machine that you could crank and then you could say, calculate you know, the log of something, calculate the sign of something. So you would have purpose-built devices, whereas this one, you could change the equation that you were calculating. So, in, so where's the software? So the software and the single purpose device were the, and the hardware were together. I mean, it, it just, it's arbitrary where you draw the line. I mean, you can see it these days. What's hardware, what's software? The most obvious difference now is, is your graphics cards. You know, what used to be in software has been put into optimized hardware for just for calculating pixel location so you can have, you know, really spiffy graphics. Is the, I mean, the, the line is shifting. Right? The line shifts depending on what you build into the hardware. Where's the software here? It just depends on where you draw the line. I mean, the, the, it calculates equations. That's fixed. That's built into it. What you input as, or what you program into this to, to calculate, or what, what equations to calculate is in the back. Um, there's a number of features of this that is eerily similar to modern systems. Um, one, uh, 32, car 32 digits. You know, why 32 digits? Well, you could say multiple of two. But he's working with digits. I mean, and, and you know, when we do binary now, it's, it's base two. Okay, why 32? This thing here is the handle that drives the whole thing. You would have to turn the crank around four times in order to do one step in the calculation. Um, this is very similar to the clock in your, you know, logical arithmetic unit, the thing that you learn about in, in, in undergraduate computer architecture. This is the tempo. This is the calculation. Each step goes around and around like that. I mean, it makes you wonder how much of what we're doing has been influenced, shaped, limited, constrained by, by our, the history of computing by the different in, uh, uh, inventions that people have come up with. OK, so that was the slide is for the video. Ah, anyone recognize this? ENIAC, ENIAC, or, or ENIAC, depending on what your accent is. OK, can someone point to the computer? <laughs> this is the computer. I am not making. Her job title is computer. Okay, they hire during this era and even before it. You know, from from in the 1940s, 1930s, 1920s, they hired young women, and it was always young women to be computers. And they would ha their job title is computer. And what did they do? Well, they did math. They derived, you know, they they did integrals, derivatives, and things like that. They calculated numbers very similar to what the difference engine did. Like, you know, I need you to calculate ballistics tables. I need you to calculate this or that. And, and they just did math all day. And then they put, put out these tables, and other people would use them. Or that I need to calculate um, you know, some kind of optimization. I needed some kind of, um, you know, what is the best way to do this? What's the best way to you know, use these resources so that I can get the most out of it? So that's the computer. She's the computer. This, they thought of it as a big, I don't know, calculator. Right? It was just a device. 
And I really like this model here. So if she's the computer, who's the programmer? Who's programming the, com who's programming the ENIAC? Okay, so what does it mean to program the ENIAC here? This guy, he's got the mathematical equations that he wants to calculate. The ENIAC was generally used for calculating ballistics tables, which are, you know, how high should I point the gun and with how much force should I shoot the, the um, ammunition so that I can reach a certain place. And, and much of um, large hardware and software development in this era, era was driven by military requirements, you know, either breaking the code, uh, the Enigma code, um, or any uh, decrypting uh, communications, and also for making ballistics tables. So um, this mo drove a lot of the software development and hardware development. So he's, he's got some equation that he wants calculated. And she is rigging up the machine to do the, uh, the calculation that he wants. And I, uh, I try to give these, this explanation to people, and they say, well, isn't she just a compiler? And if she is just doing rote, pro, you know, rote allocation of equations, is she really a programmer? Or is, she, you know, is this a skilled job? There's no question that this is a skilled job. Um, someone gave them a bunch of these devices and say, you know, make it sing and dance. No manuals. They had to figure out how to do all of these things. Yeah? The person who built the entire thing, did they think it was a computer? Or did they, think, what, did they really think it was just a calculator? It, the, the history is ambiguous because there's the shifting terminology. They weren't quite sure. I mean, to say that it's just a computer is kind of belies our modern mindset. All right. Um, I think they, I think in modern terms, they would have thought that it was a computer. But their idea of what computer meant is different from what, uh, what we think of computer. At the time, uh, like adding machines, mechanical adding machines were common use, both, yeah. <coughs> both in you know retail and mm -hmm. business, but also in these kind of computing sweatshops. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, yeah. It, 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 this it's just a question of degree. So, it, but it follows all those calculations, yeah, um, which we're getting more and more on. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Um, so the, wh how you actually programmed the ENIAC was using wires, was using you know, um, hammers, wrenches. Um, so you know, y each one of these boxes was um, a logical unit in that it performed a particular calculation. For example, you know, this might be the cubing unit, and this might be the squaring unit, this might be the addition unit, and each one of these things represented one of the bits in the calculation. And so that you would take the results of the, this computation and then run the wires to square it, and then you would run it back to run it somewhere else to take the log of it or something like that. So what was programming? Moving wires. Um, and so this is a, puts a lot of what we're thinking on, on its head, and, and yet this is part of our history. This is part of how, how we think about programming. Come back. There we go. Um, so many of the first programmers, you know, for the fir many of the first computers, computers were originally women. And um, so for a long time, this was a female-dominated field. Like the, almost all the programmers, all of the ENIAC programmers were women. They're the ones who were the first, you know, people who, who came up with um, the ways of controlling the machine to do it to have it do arbitrary tasks. Um, just in case, you know, ENIAC was uh, is viewed as an accident. Here's a here's a bunch of pictures that I found on the History of Computing website, or the ComputingHistory.org website. So the bomb, which is um, based on a bo Polish machine used by the British to um, break codes during World War II, that's a woman in front of it. The Colossus machine at Bet Bletchley Park. Again, a woman. Um, the ENIAC machine, about half women in that picture. The IBM SSEC, the Maniac machine, I think at Harvard, and then JPL. I love this picture. 1955, this entire room. Um, the Manhattan Project. Uh, if you read Feynman's um, 
Feynman's uh, memoirs, he talks about working with the women there. Yeah. Well, you start back the original series, right? Yeah. I mean, Uhura? Explain why culturally, right? Yeah. So here's, here are the explanations for why culturally. One, uh, computers, uh, the job title, were originally all women, right? So you hired young women with uh, good math skills to calculate these things. What else? Computer switchboard or telephone switchboard operators. Somebody calls in, you find out where you want to call, you pl pull out the plug and you plug it in somewhere else. That's awfully like programming the ENIAC, right? You take a wire and then you run it in somewhere else. Um, there's a third factor. It, it just escapes me at the moment, but yeah, so cultural factors like that, yeah. Do you have an understanding of why um, they favored the women for those jobs? Were they better at the math? Were they or the, type, or the requirements well, um, of the job? It w it's culture, that these were acceptable jobs for women. Um, yeah. It was also historical. Actually, the computer job title started in the Civil War, and essentially they needed a lot of women to calculate the process. Yeah, it, especially if you're sending the men to go and fight, or, it, or if there's, this, this is also the gender division of work, that the men made the, designed the computers and then, or designed the devices, and then the women did the programming. Uh, Andrew, and then you, yeah. Sorry, Yeah, okay. <laughs> So it also strikes me this lower left picture um, just as easily could be a stenography pool or exactly or yeah that was pool. yeah that's exactly it that was the third reason that I that escaped me okay punch cards what does that look like you know typing stenography um, and this picture I don't have a date for it but you can figure it out maybe from the from the hairstyle and the clothes this is where it all went horribly wrong. <laughs> <laughs> um, and this was an advertisement for the computer, you know, and here's a user. Anyone can use it. Hmm? You know, it's like, you know, the suggestion, putting a woman next to it and saying anyone can use it. Um, and uh, so I, in, in, in the past, I've done studies of, you know, the participation rates of women. And when the first computer science degrees came out, um, women's participation rates were really high, you know, up in the 50-60% range, especially when they started out in the math and physics groups um, of different universities. And it was viewed as an academic subject. And so if you were good at math, this was a natural transition for you. Um, it may, so, and uh, the numbers um, kind of peaked in the 80s, and then they've gone down and down and down ever since. That's a separate discussion. Uh, that's, a, that's an entire talk all by itself, but um, we can think about that. Uh, also, another thing that may have contributed to this um, is that with the creation of Fortran, um, they, so, so Fortran, when they, well, after they came up with Fortran, they said, okay, anybody with, who's good at math can, can do the programming now, and, and you know, not anyone who's good at logic. Um, it doesn't just have to be these specialists. And so they started recruiting uh, chess players to be computer programmers. Um, and, and so that started to tip the balance to, more towards men because it was, you know, they found more male chess players. So that, that contributed to it as well. Um, so this is one of the, so the point here is that, you know, the, what is an appropriate role for someone, the culture of, you know, what determines someone's career choice um, and what the possibilities that people see for themselves you know, are, are socially and historically determined as well. I mean, look at all the historical examples that we just brought up. Okay, who recognizes this? Fortran, Fortran. The first programming language, every single family tree or genealogy of programming languages starts with Fortran at the beginning. Um, Fortran is the parent of every language that has come since. Um, Fortran is a high-level language. It was created in 1953 by Jim Backus. Not, um, and the, the, it was created in response to an economic problem, not an intellectual problem. It's not that someone came along and said, boy, it'd be cool to have a high-level programming language. It's that um, the cost of programming computers became so high that they said, we have to find a cheaper, easier way to do this. Because um, they would build these machines, millions of dollars. In order to set it up to calculate a particular equation, it would take about three months. 
to set up all the wires to have it go just so. And then it would run for a couple of weeks. They would get all the numbers that they needed. They would print the tables, and then we'd do the next job. Computers were becoming more pervasive. Everybody wanted one. They could do all sorts of cool things with it. You know, you could keep your accounts. You could keep, um, uh, you can calculate inventory and things like that. So, in even, but even though people wanted computers, they didn't necessarily have the computers on site. So, computers IBM was offering uh, as a kind of a service. We would host the computers. You would have a share in the computer. We'd, we'd host this computer for you. We'd have the programmers for you. You just tell us what you want it to do. Um, and so they, so when the cost of developing the software, so telling the pro computer what to do, began to outstrip the cost of the hardware, that's when they say, we've got to make this easier. So stored programs, programs that were stored in software, whatever software meant, because this was still punch cards. Punch cards are physical, but this is software. Um, so where's the software? Uh, OK, so we're starting to see modern lines emerge here. Um, so they would store the cards, um, they would store the software in, in cards, and it would, you know, this is, this is readable, right? You could read this as a human being, and that was the whole point. Um, the, and, and it's not just that Fortran was a language, Fortran was al also a body of technology, including the compiler that made this possible. Um, Grace Hopper made her name by coming up with intermediate codes that were more human readable that you would translate into computer code. And she came up with these techniques by hand. You know, when you see this, translate it to this number. Again, your undergraduate compiler course, this is what you learn. Jim Backus came up with an entire infrastructure for doing this. Um, and also, not only did you translate the codes, if you see this, turn it right into this code, you see this, just turn it into this code. Some of it was, was, was very mechanistic, um, very algorithmic. Um, but part of it was that he uh, used dumb solutions instead of really clever human solutions. For example, um, the allocation of which instruction goes where in memory, where you are going to place these instructions, was considered a real art. And this is where, where Jim Backus received a lot of his resistance. That, you know, automatic programming, this is what automatic programming is, is not possible. You can't possibly do as good a job as human beings laying out these instructions in memory. Now, this is not one of the criteria for what is a real programmer these days. You know, no one is evaluated on this. We've deferred some of these tasks over to the computer. Um, and no one is viewed any, you know, less favorably because they can't line things up in the most efficient way in memory. OK, so I'm going to stop trying to do some history and try and move into the modern era. OK, uh, can anyone figure what, what this is? It's the output of a make file. It's a build, That's right? It's a build. You've built some software. You've compiled it. You've linked it. And you've, you've put it together into a jar. It's a build. All right, so what's this? It's a build. It's a build. All right, this is um, from the TV show Extreme uh, Maker Home Edition, Ex Extreme Makeover Home Edition. You've got you know big machines. You've got people. You've got somebody standing around talking to each other. Other people working. They've got safety equipment and stuff like that. They're making a house. Why is this? A build. And why is this a build? Um, I mean, why is it in computer development or, or in software development, this is the build? But in construction in the rest of the world, this is the build. What are you doing here? Are you building the software? Well, yeah, you're kind of building the software. A computer is taking the code that you wrote, compiling it, and putting it together. Well, what about the work of? requirements? What about the work of actually creating the codes? What about all of that other work? Are you not building the software then? Then why is this called the build? I mean, there's, this is a computer doing all of the work. And, and if this is what is viewed as the build, you know, maybe there's something a little bit funny with this picture. And then in the rest of the world, this is the build. The is it the meta? <coughs> The, the code, the software, the, 
that's not the source code is the blueprints. The source code is the source. It's kind of like in the Matrix. Oh, Neo, he is one with the source. You know, he, he knows the source. And this is just some, some stuff that happens before the, before the building um, can be occupied. Before it's it's occupied. Yeah. And, and somewhere in this, it, it breaks down. Right? I mean, the, the metaphor, I think you're right in the metaphor, but the way in which we think about developing software, I think is um, th these kinds of metaphors, having it made it into software development, kind of makes us th see things in a funny way. Right? It, it, this is kind of like the, the, our, use, our environment as users or as customers. We're just used to things being a certain way, and until we kind of say, hey, what's going on? Um, and this is the, then, then you can call out the, the um, contradictions and the, the things that don't make sense. And I think this uh, metaphor and this analogy is similar to this. Um, it's, hard, it's a little bit hard to see, but this is a player piano, okay? And there's a roll up at the top that is the music. And it can work as a normal piano as well. You can play a player piano by pressing on the keys. But a player piano, what makes it a player piano, is that you put in a roll of music up at the top, and someone is sitting at the, at the keyboard, in front of the piano, and their job is to pedal. Pedal as, as you know, energetically as they can to make sure the whole thing works. And this is a person playing the piano. This is a player piano. This is a piano player. Um, so this person is actually creatively, actively playing the piano. This is the act of creation over there. What's going over, on over here? This is very similar to compilation. The script has been written. The computer is just doing the job of turning that script from one representation to another. This guy is like the build master. This is the build master. This is the build machine. That's the build script. And he's peddling for all he's worth, just like your build master. Um, the build master is responsible for making the build happen, and, and this is a bit of a black art too. You know, just just actually getting this to to build. You know, you can't always build every single piece of uh, software on, on on any machine. I know that from my experience, downloading open source and getting it to build is, you know, you need to have a lot of tricks up your sleeve. And I know many companies have a dedicated build machine, and they have a dedicated person looking after the build. So I think using the metaphor of, of the build or using the label of build for your build process, like your ant script or your make file or anything like that, is like a player piano. And leaving out um, all of the, cre the, the creative work other than just turning your code into zeros and ones, you know, kind of al elides the, the work of the piano player. I mean, who made, who made that scroll? Who made the, um, who composed the music, who um, turned the music into turned the music into the scroll, and also, and, and this is this I think is the creative work of, of uh, computer programming. So this is the, the the piano player versus the player piano. Okay. This is yes, yes. The person who pedals the player piano does get to control some aspects of the program. Yes. Does get to control speed. Yeah. Um, Presumably. It's not just... Uh, they, yeah, I, I think they... I think it's... Um, if they don't pedal hard enough, um, then it goes slower. But once you pedal hard enough, uh, then pedaling harder will not th get the music to play harder. Or faster. So can you view him as the end user who runs a program created by the piano player, which is reported, compiled, yeah, turned into an application by I think the scroll is the program, and he's then the user. Like someone who created the scroll. Yeah, I tried that metaphor. I tried that metaphor, but it's actually, if you, keep, if you, you push that metaphor, it becomes really unpleasant. So what are you teaching them, the, the uh, end user to do? Is the end user's entire job to pedal? They're benefiting from the program. They're listening to the music. Uh, but it, it separates them from being a producer versus a consumer. Am I, I mean, is this the music that they want? This is the music that they're stuck with. This is the music that you thought you want, wanted them to hear. They 
theoretically pick the scroll to put in there. Theoretically. Theoretically. Pick other scrolls if, to, for whatever music they want to hear. I mean, this guy could be playing with a movie, like in the sound of here, right? And he could be picking the appropriate scroll for the movie that makes it sound good. Um, What's his choice? <laughs> yep. I, I would personally view the gentleman on the top picture more as like an ops team in the, in the concept of, you know, I've worked a lot with web apps in the past in teams where we had a live operation. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of a layer between the end user and you know, even after the code was already built, you had to have an operations team to keep it maintained and make sure that you, know, you had your application tools running properly on the server. Uh, so you know, I view the user as like the listener of the music. Um, in this case, maybe even able to ask the player to change the music mm -hmm. the piano. But in this case, you'd have a layer of ops that would be maintaining the code or maintaining the bits that have already been built. That's mm -hmm. kind of how I do it. Anyone else? Um, I, I think. Um, I think none of the what your your comments are well taken. I and I think that you um, raise possible alternative interpretations of this distinction. Um, but I what I I intuitively don't like about um, these metaphors, and maybe this is what I don't like about software development, is that um, the user is kind of like a receiver. Um, there's this big gap between you know I, the makers and the people who are receiving um, receiving the products of what is being made. Um, and, that, and that's a lot of the what is going on with Web 2.0 stuff, a little bit, but that you know the pro, the the consumers are al also producers. That's also where um, intellectual property law falls down. That you know, can I take use this and make something else with it, or can I create things? Or you're supposed to receive this stuff and you're not supposed to modify it. Um, and I think this conversation or, or this point about what is the role of users. Um, is going to carry on in the next few slides. So I, I encourage you to bring this up again in a couple. Yeah. Just one of the distinction is in the lower picture, it's not clear whether she's composing music on the spot or whether she's playing some music that somebody else composed mm -hmm. and she's just playing it, mm -hmm. which I think is an interesting distinction. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a lot of money in that distinction. Um, I mean, sure, yeah, she, can, all about she can improvise while she's playing and, and yeah. improvise. Mm-hmm. So, um, so this is waterfall model. I think we all learned this at school. And this is put out as a software process. And this is held up as a pretty good software process because this is where, I mean, even though nobody uses it, this is, this is the ideal because it's clean, it's engineering that you do all of the requirements, you get all of the requirements, and you hand over to, this, to the specification stage. What do you hand over? A document. And this document is complete. You know, and, the specific, and you never have to talk to the users again. And then the specification stage, they take as input a document. And what do they output? A document. And you hand it over to the design phase. And this probably, you're getting into a different team from requirements to design. And uh, you hand over this document. And somebody else makes the design. And, and of course, this is, um, uh, came from a, an, a hardware development model that you, know, you make these things, and then there's a manufacturing step, in, and it's done forever. Design to implementation. Here, you have a little bit of switch. You hand over you know, code as well, which is different from the documents. So, so we tend to really like this step. This is the part that makes software programming or computer programming really special. Otherwise, we're just writing documents. And then the testing and then the maintenance. We're just handing artifacts over to, and of course we all know this is fiction, right? That we hand over, we, there's actually a lot of interaction. There's a lot of feedback. There's a lot of toing and froing. You can't come up with a really good architecture until you've got a really good uh, requirements. And you can't come up with, you don't actually know what all the requirements are until you know what some of the design is. So it's kind of like messy and all over the place. And so um, it's just not as clean as this. And so other process models have come up, like Spiral and Agile and things like that, that tries to capture what, uh, what, are the, what the process should be. Now, OK, what's this? That's right. Very good. <laughs> yes, this is a daily stand-up meeting for an Agile team. They're standing in front of their you know, task board. 
And uh, it, I, most of you probably know, but da the Agile daily stand-up is at the beginning of each day. Um, you have a meeting where you're standing up, so you try and keep it short, under 15 minutes. You know, what did you do yesterday? What are you going to do today? Um, what, is there anything blocking you? Do you need any help? Just to touch base with everyone on the team. Where's the process? Is this software process? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. This is, so where is this? Oh, uh, don't even worry about the structure. I mean, this is the process by which software is made, right? I mean, there's the, we, we did a study a couple years ago that, you know, we asked people if you use a process, and they say, no, we don't use a process. And when people say we don't use a process, they mean we don't use a formal documented process. But we have things that we normally do, and we, have, and we adapt and improvise in the following ways. But I think this is part of the assumptions or the bias, or, or this is just how we use the language, that if you don't follow something that's been written down, or if you don't do the same thing every time, you're not following a process. This is the process. This is not the process. Right? Is this the process? Or is this the process? Well, so you're missing a slide. You're missing the, there are schematic views of the Agile process. I, I, yeah. Figure eight yeah, yeah, yeah. And all this stuff. Yeah. Um, you, could, you could show people approximating the, the waterfall flow chart, or you could show people approximating the Agile flow chart. Both of them have flow chart. Both of them have people deviating from that model when they implement it. So are, are you talking about the delta between no. the model and the execution, or the delta between the um, waterfall and agile? Model? I'm, I'm talking about uh, what the textbooks say process is. And I'm talking about uh, that versus what is the process, or what is the, the, the body of work, or the work that you have to do to get software built. Agile textbooks also. It's, yeah. not, it's not fair to compare a representation of one process with the execution of another. Um, I, I agree, and, and um, I realize I'm missing a slide, so let's pretend I have a, a, um, a representation of an Agile. Um, but even if you do have, have an Agile representation, um, and I can, I can quickly pull one up. I can, I can pull one up because I actually have one. Um, that picture the process or are those people the process? Okay. The answer is yes and yes. Okay. This is the agile process. So let's say, is this the agile process? This is the process. This is the, the, the prescription of what you should be doing. But this is the full-bodied enactment of that process. This is the work of developing the software. But I think even, my point is, even in this representation, there are things that are missing. OK, we all agree that nobody actually does this. And even in this, there's stuff that's missing. Oh, I think we all agree that nobody does this. Yeah, actually, I went to an Agile conference um, last uh, in in uh, in August, and um, there's a new process called Scrum Butt. We do Scrum Butt. We don't do this. We don't do that. And everybody does Scrum Butt. Nobody does Scrum. Wouldn't it be more fair to just call it a philosophy than a process? Then, in those cases, like the act, the, the idea, ideology of Scrum, or the ideology. Okay. Of so this is one of the things that um, Agile is upfront about, that Waterfall is not upfront about. Agile, you know, what is the thing that holds all Agile toge together? 
It's the Agile Manifesto, right? And really what Agile, all Agile processes have in common is that this belief or the set of values that, you know, some things are more important than others. Yeah. So what's Don Kadeh's manifesto with the art of computer programming? If presumably the implementation of software development involves quite a bit more than just bits and machine instructions. Since it's built by a human, there is a philosophy behind it. So what is Knuth's What is Knuth's philosophy when it comes to software development? I don't actually know, but I think there's an XKCD <laughs> comic about that. Um, I, I, I don't remember reading him any, saying anything specific about this, but judging from his actions, he would say it's fairly mathematical and it's about you know, the, the input the creation of codes and things like that. I mean, look at, look at LaTeX, for example, right? He uh, created LaTeX because he wanted to have something to typeset, you know, his, his uh, documents. Because when he went from version 1 to version 2, his system had gone away. And this is what he created for people to create documents. It looks like code, right? That's my guess. Um, and, okay, so there, the, the point I'm trying to make is that this is, even if this is the process, not this, right? Even if you say, let's do Agile, there's stuff that's missing from here. And we've been doing um, field studies of Agile. This is not one of the teams we studied, but we've been studying um, Agile teams and Agile artifacts and with the roles that Agile artifacts play. And um, let's see, let me, let me skip this one because we're running out of time a little bit. Okay, so this is the diagram that we came up with for the you know, for lack of a better word, the process. How is it that people interact with each other? What are the roles that artifacts play in the environment? How do things work together so that we can develop software? So each of these, you know, actors are participants in an agile software project. And um, they interact, they have their input into the process through a user story. Either you're feeding in user stories or you're taking a user story and you're implementing it. You also have personal artifacts. This is something that we found common to all, um, t all of the sites that we study, that um, everyone hides their personal artifacts. Oh, I just wrote these notes for myself. Agile says, you know, as little documentation as uh, you know, no, no unnecessary documentation, and that official documentation is lightweight, right? So there's nothing, so people hide their artifacts and say, oh, this is just for me. And uh, so that's why we have these personal artifacts. And, and it's like the more you hang around a team, the more these things, they can't, as a, as a researcher, they tried to hide them from you. Um, and uh, so they have their own personal artifacts. And what is being built? It's not just code is being built, but test cases are being built. Functionality is being built. Um, so the software in use is being built. The, um, that's the deployed, running, integrated software. And then there's this whole thing has a piece of conversation about it. Because very little is written down, how do you get requirements? You talk to somebody. How do you do validation? You talk to somebody. How do you figure out the dependencies? You talk to somebody. So there's this entire conversation that's going on. Um, and, in, and this is kind of like these are individual private spaces. And this is the public space in a project. And these, these people come from their private spaces or private representations of work and participate in this public representation of work. Um, and they do this through user stories, and they're able to do this um, bef because they are backed up by their roles, backed up by their personal artifacts, personal credibility, um, background and experience, and things like that. Um, so th what we found in this study made us wonder about what is, what is the process of building software. Um, and it reminded me of the Brooks quotation from the, from the last slide um, that what is building software? You know, and he, Brooks said, I believe, that, this is Fred Brooks from No Silver Bullet, I believe the hard part of building software to be the, cons the specification, design, and testing of this conceptual construct, not the labor of representing it and testing the fidelity of the representation. 
And so the views of software process that we see described in, you know, in this, in this model or even in this model places source code at the center but leaves everything else out of it. Like source code is it. This is what we are making. And so when you interrupt somebody to ask a question, they feel like you're interrupting their work. Um, or that if they have to go to a meeting to figure out what the requirements are, they feel like this is not really my job. You're preventing me from coding, which is what I really want to do. I see wrinkled faces, so that means it's time to stop and have people ask questions. Yep. <clears throat> so I, I strongly uh, agree with your, your final conclusion that there's much more to software development than just the coding. But I, I think I disagree perhaps semantically with uh, what you're defining as hardware, software, uh, and algorithms, and programming. So I think I would define, for example, software as, well, the hardware is the, the, the physical um, pieces, where the software is more the changes in the algorithm. And there might be an input which is um, which doesn't affect the algorithm, but um, but affects the performance of the thing. So, for example, in the difference engine, I would say that there is programming, but all the programming was of the hardware. And there, uh, to my knowledge, there is no change in the algorithm that you can do on the fly uh, without changing hardware. Um, but there are inputs that people can do to, and then. I think for the like the ENIAC, for the running the wires, I would distinguish there's someone who comes up with a, what wire should go where to do the algorithm that we want it to compute. And then there's somebody who actually plugs in the, the wires, and I'm not sure if they were the same person. They're the same person. Okay. And so then I, I would say the person coming up with the algorithm is the programmer. And that, again, is my definition. I'm not sure how well that meshes with yours or others. but. Um, the, the programmer is the person who comes up with the algorithm, and then there's someone else who might be the same person who puts it into action in the wires and wiring things up. It could be the person... My, my nine-year-old last night wrote a web browser by reading from a book and typing exactly what it said. Now, I would not call him a programmer yet, but he created a, a program. But I think the person who designed the program in the book was the programmer. and so. My son just sort of typed in the things, and um, so I'm defining a programmer as a subset of what's needed. The person who can sort of take the, what's needed, the the requirements, um, and turn it into code. That's what Knuth uh, writes about, um, and certainly is an important part of the process. But I agree that there's much more to the process. There's the re gathering requirements and the architecture and figuring. Okay. Does anyone else want to jump in? Okay. Well, I, I, I know you all want to jump in. I can tell. By the... Okay. okay. So, um, the thing that I think is missing from that diagram is sort of the shared understanding of the three people in that diagram of mm -hmm. what, the, what they're building, which is, I mean, the artifact is one manifestation of what they think they're building, but they themselves in their heads have some sort of shared understanding with when they go to the scrum meeting and the daily stand-up and they say like, oh, I'm working on this. The other couple people in the room also have an idea of what, why are you working on this and how is it contributing to the overall effort and what is the effort and what is the goal? And that's kind of missing, I think. Um, that's part of the conversation that you have in there. But, and I would argue that there is no such thing as shared understanding. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We all have mental models. We don't have a shared one, but we, we synchronize them through the conversation. So I think what's missing is your XKCD people with the, the big empty heads. Those heads are full of stuff. And they're constantly being synced through conversations and through examining the artifacts and through creating artifact both personal and shared. Um, so that's it. I think what's critically missing from from this and the picture of Agile or the picture of Waterfall is that they're humans that, for example, if you go back to the picture of Agile, there's a sealed cardboard box. Somebody opens the box and takes that piece of software out and appropriates that software for their own needs. 
there's, um, and I I'm deliberately gonna, left that out. Oh, that feels bad. <laughs> I, I do. I deliberately left that out because that is a huge, complicated, very, it, it's as complex as what we talked about in that one hour today. I could spend another hour on it. Mm -hmm. um, and, and when I bring that up, it actually confuses the conversation okay. about this. Um, but I'm happy to give another one hour talk. <laughs> in, uh, I was just going to say, I, I, I like the comment you made about uh, was it your, your child you said? The yeah. web browser code, I don't know your name, but the gentleman that said that. Uh, I, I like the comment you made about that, and it reminded me also of like, the projects they're working on, uh, like Boku, I don't know if you're aware of Boku, but for, you know, for children pro programming via Xbox. There's so many different ways things are changing now in, with code, and I, I guess for me, the way that I view it is more and more now uh, of a philosophy or, or something that's a bit higher level than just the actual process of writing the code. In fact, the way I look at it is every step of my life uh, it's kind of like, you know, if I'm a programmer, if I'm a developer, it'll, it'll affect every step of, of what I do. And I, I think it doesn't matter whether I'm writing code or whether I'm doing something else. They're only extensions of what the core, you know, motivation I have to get the job done. I think writing code is only just another way of doing it. Just like, you know, you can say different languages, you can say the same thing. I view that as kind of... Yeah, no, I, I, I agree with that. Um, and. I mean, I started off this talk by saying we have intuitive ideas about what is real programming, what's not real programming, whether someone is technical or not technical. And um, I haven't made up my mind on a lot of e these issues. And the thing about STS is that it's good for raising questions, but it doesn't give you any answers. Right? So I've raised a lot of questions about what counts as programming, what constitutes programming. Um, you know, and I'm pointing to the parts that, miss, that, that are, are missing or that might be missing or here are our assumptions or here's how we use terminology in a certain way. And, um, and, and, and that was my goal. I'm not quite sure what I'm going to do with this, but that's the, that's the goal. That, you know, I've raised some interesting questions and I can tell by the looks on your faces that some gears are turning in, in your head. Um, and uh, I think I'm just going to finish off with one last XKCD comic which is exactly your point back there, that, you know, um, who is being programmed? Is it the computer that's being programmed? Or is it us as programmers who are being programmed? And as you're saying, when, we're, when I'm walking down the street, I can see myself as a programmer. And this is what I love about XKCD, is that, you know, what is it, me as a programmer? And, there's, a, there's an entire ethos about this. I can look at the world. And, and sometimes I laugh because I've been reading all this STS stuff. And I can, you know, the, 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 the joke in SKCD uh, is that, you know, you kind of step outside yourself and you're analytical about yourself. But then I'm reading this STS stuff and there's this, this part that's watching the analytical part and going, oh, yes, I just saw you behave as a programmer. And then it's like impossible. <laughs> um, the, the STS reading that I've been doing is just gets into everything. And I see things going on in the news or I see things going on you know, in politics or somebody's comment. I say, oh, I know why they said that. It's because of this, that, and any of the other thing. Um, but yeah, this is the compiler speaking up to the human saying, you know, double check your pointers. So um, who's being programmed? And this is, you know, what Gina talks about. So who's being programmed? What are we programming people to do? We've created the software and we've, you say, oh, well, social networking, we've got Facebook and saying that this is the box that social interactions happen in. Is this all of it? Is this the sum total? Uh, I, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not comfortable with saying that Facebook is it. And I'm not comfortable with ever saying that, you know, all of human interrelations can be captured by software, and yet software tries, or at least, you know, for the purposes of banking, or for the purposes of walking up to an ATM, you know, I'm being trained. This is what I'm allowed to do in front of an ATM. But anyways, there, there ends my talk. All right, well, thank you. Thank you.